Hello, this is Professor Diane Hildebrand speaking. I am your lecturer for reaction design. And this is contact session one, where we are looking at reaction kinetics. Now the contents that would be covered in this session are reactions and stoichiometry, the reaction rate, rate equations, as well as mass balances across reactors. In this session, we will consider simple single reactions, and in later sessions, we will look at more complicated situations. Now, let's first think about reactions and reactors. What sort of reactors are we familiar with, and what do reactors look like? Now, the reactor is the unit in a process where the chemical transformations or reactions take place. Now, examples of reactors and chemical transformations, for example, in your body, we have low temperature combustion of glucose occurring. Now, glucose, which is this molecule here, and excuse the wobbly handwriting, but it's um, C6H12O6, reacts with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water. Notice the chemical transformations in the glucose, the carbon is bound to hydrogen and oxygen, and then you have oxygen on its own, and the carbon reacts, and at the end of the reaction, the carbon is bound to oxygen to form carbon dioxide, and uh, the hydrogen and oxygen are bound together to make water. Now, a methanol synthesis reactor, as shown on the picture, are fairly large reactors that are found in industry. And um, methanol is produced from syngas, or synthesis gas, which is a combination of CO and hydrogen. So the reaction is carbon monoxide plus hydrogen going to methanol. You also get reactors where you have solids and gases reacting. And so, for example, in the production of metals, one starts with the oxide, and here we have an iron oxide drawn over there. It reacts with hydrogen and the oxide is reduced to make the iron and water is a byproduct. Now the kinds of things we, we want to answer when designing reactors are questions like how big must the reactor be to achieve the desired product and the desired conversions? Or how do we set the flow rate or the temperature or the pressure to make the reactor more selective, smaller, optimized? And these are all questions we will be working towards answering in this course. Now let's look at reactions and stoichiometry, and this is a bit of revision. In a reaction, what happens is that the species or the atoms in the reactants are sort of disengaged and recombined to make the products. What is important is that the elements or the number of carbon atoms, for example, on the left-hand side of the reaction must be the same as those on the right-hand side. And the, and the same for any other species or atoms that you might have. So the number of atoms on each side of a reaction must balance. They are rearranged, but they're still there. So looking at the methanol synthesis reaction, we see we have carbon monoxide reacting with hydrogen to make methanol scratched out, excuse me. Now, if we look at carbon, we see we've got one carbon on the left-hand side and one carbon on the right-hand side in the methanol. And so if we look at the balance, there's one on the left-hand side, one on the right-hand side. If we look at hydrogen, hydrogen is coming in here, let's change the pen color, through there. And there are four hydrogen atoms on the left-hand side, and similarly, we have four hydrogens here. There's three plus one, four, which balances. And I've made such a mess, but you should be able to see there's one oxygen on the left-hand side and one on the right-hand side. Let's consider another situation, the reduction of the iron oxide. And we have our reaction written up there. It's the iron oxide reacting with hydrogen to give us iron and water. If we look at our reaction, our species are high, high iron, oxygen and hydrogen, and so we have iron, hydrogen and oxygen in our table. There are two iron atoms on the left-hand side 
and two on the right hand side. Similarly, if we look at the hydrogen, we have six hydrogens here and six hydrogens sitting in the water on the right hand side. And oxygen, there's three on the left hand side in the oxide and three that are removed with the water. And so notice how the number of iron, hydrogen and oxygen on each side of the equation stays the same. Now, what I'd like you to do is try and balance these reactions and see if you're able to. And I suggest you pause the video at this stage and the next slide will give the answers. Right, here we have the balanced equations. And if you've had difficulty with this, uh, contact us and let us know. Or alternatively, go back to your chemistry textbooks uh, because this would have co been covered in one of your elementary chemistry books. Now, in reactor design, what is the importance of stoichiometry? Well, one of the things that's telling us is the proportions at which chemicals are changing. And so, for example, if we look at this reaction with methane reacting with water to form CO and hydrogen, this is known as steam reforming of methane. What we see is that for every one mole of methane we use up, we also use one mole of water. Again, for every one mole of methane we use up, we produce one mole of CO and we produce three moles of hydrogen. This is very important later on when we have to relate the various numbers of moles of products and reactants when designing our reactor. Here's another example where we have CO and hydrogen producing ethene and CO2. What this reaction balance tells us is that for every four moles of CO we consume, we also consume two moles of hydrogen. We produce one mole of ethene and two moles of carbon dioxide. Right, another concept that is very important that we clear on is concentration. And what I would like to do is very carefully define concentration that we all understand what we mean by it. Now, Consider that we have some element, and I've drawn a box down there at the bottom right hand side of the screen. This element is small enough that the distribution of species is uniform in that box. In other words, if we're looking at some molecule, perhaps it contains carbon monoxide, they're equally spread throughout the box. The volume of that element is V, and the size and how we choose the size of that element depends on the situation. If the reactor has very high concentration gradients in it, the element might be a differential element. In other words, very, very small. If the reactor is well stirred and there are no concentration gradients inside the reactor, the element might be the entire volume of the reactor. Now, we define that we have Ni number of moles of uh, species I in that volume. So we've looked in here and we've looked at some species and counted all the number of of, of molecules of, of, sorry, moles of I, or, oh, I suppose it could be molecules of I that we have in there. Now, concentration, we use the symbol CI as shown there, and that says we're looking at the concentration of species I. The units of concentration are moles per volume. Remember, NI is our nomenclature for the number of moles of species I, and so the concentration would be the number of moles of species I in the volume we're looking at divided by the volume. Right, let's make sure we understand concentration and think of the, and let's do the following thought experiment. We have an aqueous solution of A, and let's say the concentration in that solution is 10 moles of A a litre. And to have a picture in mind, I've drawn a beaker there with uh, in red, and that's our solution A. And so the concentration in there is 10 moles of A a litre. We have a second beaker, and it's an aqueous solution of B, and the concentration of B is 15 moles of B a litre, and I'll draw it in B, uh, in blue. So that's solution B, and it's in blue there. We take 50 moles of the red solution and 50 moles of the blue solution, and we mix them together in a, another beaker. And I've drawn the mixture in purple, because when you mix red and blue, we get purple. Uh, we're going to assume there's no volume change of mixing, 
In other words, the final volume of that purple beaker is 50 milliliters, the sum of the, mol the volume of the solution A and solution B. Please, this is not always true, and you cannot make that assumption in general. Only certain reactions will there be no volume change on mixing in certain solutions. However, what we want to now ask in this example is what is the concentration of A in the mixture and what is the concentration of B in the mixture? I suggest you pause here, try and answer that solution, and then look at the next slide where the solution will be given. Right, let's have a look at how we solve this. Firstly, let's work out the number of moles of A we have in solution in the beaker, the red beaker, and how many moles of A we have in the blue beaker. I'm going to do this in general and we'll put the numbers in lastly. So what we'll assume is that, or use a symbol, that that symbol there, and let's change the pen to red, this symbol here is the concentration of A initially, in other words, in solution A. And CB0 is the concentration of B initially, before we mix. The concentration of A and B in the purple mixture is CA and CB, and that is what we're trying to work out. Now, let's start working out the number of moles of A that we have in this red beaker, the red solution, or solution A. The number of moles of A, and if you think of our nomenclature, that's NA, as shown there, is, by definition, the concentration of A times the volume. And the concentration of A in that red beaker is CA0 times the volume. Similarly, if we work out the number of moles of B in the blue solution, it is NB, where that would be, to show you N is the number of moles, and B is the species we're looking at. And by definition, it's the concentration of B in the beaker, which is CB0 times the volume of the solution in the beaker. B. However, we know when we mix that the number of moles of A we start off, and let's take a different color, the number of moles of A in here must be equal to the number of moles of A we have finally, because we don't have a reaction. So A can't be made or destroyed. If we write that in symbols, we say the number of moles of A we have must be equal to the concentration in the purple beaker, which is CA, times the volume of that beaker, which is 2 times V. And that must be equal to the number of moles of A we had in the red beaker, which we said was CA0 times V. If we simplify this equation, we see that the concentration of A in the mixture, in other words, in the purple beaker, is half the concentration in the red beaker, CA0 divided by 2. And similarly with B, we would work out the concentration of B in the purple beaker, is half the concentration of B in the blue beaker. If we now put numbers in, the concentration of A in the purple beaker is, by the equation here, the concentration of A initially, which is the 10 moles of A a litre that we had in the red beaker, divided by 2. And so the concentration of A in the purple beaker is 5 moles of A per litre. And the concentration of B in the purple beaker is the concentration that we had of B initially, in other words, in, in the blue beaker, which was 15 moles of B a litre, divided by 2, and so that's 7.5 moles per litre of B.